very much, Josue. Thank you to the panelists for being here. Thank you to this audience for your interest in this topic. I want to start with the first question to the panelists that also allows everyone to sort of be positioned with, or to understand your position in the supply chain and the perspective that you're bringing to the audience. So the first question just going down the line, could you introduce yourself and your organization to this audience by telling us what is the business case for sustainability that you see amongst the clients and the companies that you work with? Sure. Um, so great to be here. My name is Jason Berryhill and I'm the co-founder of Whole Chain. Uh, we are a traceability solution for traceability and transparency for everything from small scale farms to uh, you know, large consumer brands to big retail. And um, you know, that question, we deal a lot in responsible sourcing. And so I guess probably I have a, um, a different lens than, than some others that are in a different position in the supply chain. But um, I, I asked a similar question to one of our customers uh, at Wegmans, their seafood category manager, and, and I was asking something along those lines, what is the business case for sustainability? And his answer was, um, well, you know, if you walk into a Wegmans and you go into the restroom, it's gonna be really clean. And he goes, we didn't do a business calculation on that, we just felt like that was the best thing for our customers. And he said, the same thing goes with responsible sourcing. It's not like we're gonna have a premium product where we, we feel like it's responsible, it's just the right thing for our customers. And I guess the, the answer to that question then from, from my perspective and the customers we deal with is a lot of them it's table stakes now. And it might have been something where it was a calculation in years past and it's become not so much a calculation anymore, so. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Rachel Schwabach with CH Robinson. Um, and so we are one of the most connected logistics platforms around the world. Um, I would say, you know, what we do every day is work in the transportation side, so we're working with tens, hundreds of thousands of customers and carrier partners. We don't own the assets. We don't own ships and trucks and um, move the things, but we work with partners around the world to do that. Um, and so when we're talking to our shippers or our carrier partners about why it matters to them, I think, you know, Josue spoke to many of the kind of broad categories. He said it in a much cooler accent than my Minnesotan accent, but I think, you know, it comes down to... Uh, <laughs> my Mexican accent. <laughs> but my Minnesotan accent can, will come out soon. You'll hear my O's. Um, it, it's about competitive advantage. So some of it is becoming table stakes, but I think there certainly is still competitive advantage when it comes to, to this for a lot of our shippers. Um, it's about risk management, which you also talked about, and then it's about cost savings and finding efficiencies. So those are the kind of the general, the general pieces. I think the, the thing that's really interesting about having a super broad base of shippers and carriers is who those stakeholders that are driving that when it comes to what the, you know, what the risk management looks like, or especially on the competitive advantage side, the stakeholders vary a lot. So that could be the direct consumer, that could be their investors that they're talking to, um, that could be other businesses, and we'll get into a lot of that, but I think there's, there's kind of a, a broad base of where that's coming from. But the, at the end of the day, what it is is stakeholders care about this a lot more, and the demand and the expectations are increasing. Thank you, Shannon. I'm Shannon Bouton. I am the CEO of Delterra. Uh, we are an anomaly in this group because we're a nonprofit. Um, we actually build uh, recycling and waste management ecosystems in the global south. Um, so at the, today we work in Argentina, uh, Indonesia, and Brazil with the goal of trying to build things that are, or systems that are scalable uh, and replicable uh, globally. Um, and what I, when I talk about an ecosystem, what I'm talking about is everything from designing packaging so that it is more recyclable, uh, better designed packaging, using less materials and better materials, all the way through to training households how to separate and why to separate, why they should be motivated to change their behavior in their homes, through to all of the efficiencies in the operations of collection and recollection, and recycling, and then also ensuring that there is a market to offtake that material at the end of the day at a fair price that represents the cost to recover that material uh, so that the whole system is stabilized. Um, we, are, uh, we were founded by McKinsey and Company, so our underpinning everything that we do is always a good business case. Um, but we also are uh, increasingly being funded by a lot a, of retailers and, um, and CPG companies, so uh, players like um, uh, P&G and Amcor and Mars uh, and, um, and also uh, companies like Walmart uh, who are interested in where does the packaging that they put out into the environment uh, go and how do they recover it 
Um, and the reason that that is of importance, and you know, these days, one of the things that, or the, the, the material that most people are specifically interested in, most companies are specifically interested in, is plastics packaging. Plastics packaging drives about 17% of petrochemical production these days, um, and that is a growing number. So it is also continuing to grow uh, the uh, the the demand for petrochemicals uh, and the and you know the extraction of those petrochemicals, and many corporates are now making commitments about recovering their packaging, uh, and then also um, incorporating more recycled material into their systems, uh, but the recycling system is not functioning very well, especially in um, many countries that don't even really have uh, strong waste management systems. Um, and so they're particularly interested in working with us to figure out how to recover that material, bring it back into their supply chains. So we're the sort of reverse logistics piece of it um, as we work with them. Excellent. Thank you. And, and Josue, since we're colleagues, I'm going to make it harder for you. <laughs> so, so if I summarize what I heard, I hear consumer expectation, competitive advantage, system stability, brand reputation, cost recovery. You've done a lot of projects with you know, North American firms, European firms, but you also work a lot in the Lyft Lab with other companies from around the world. Is it the same reasons that you hear the companies come to do sustainability research? Is it the, the ones that have been articulated so far? Or, or what else do you see as why people might be interested in engaging with you on research projects? I, I believe that it's uh, always uh, pressure, right, as well. Like, there is, it's also fair to say that, uh, well, some companies, when they were created, they, they, they were thinking on sustainability dimensions you know, since the inception, uh, but not the majority. The vast majority are, you know, in the business because they want to create value and at the same time also, you know, gain some profits. So suddenly there is there is the risks, you know, there are things happening and then they say, well, we need to do something about it. And they uh, those that at least um, have approached us in the last, like it, it have been different waves. You know, 10 years ago, it was just the first exercise for those that thought that might be really a risk. It was really the minority, but they thought there is a market shift happening. This is 2010, 11, right? And let's conduct the first carbon footprint, the LCA analysis. This was very famous, right? Trying to put something in, on the labels. And then later, start changing, right? We saw also, well, because of this, the, the situations that some NGOs detected in some big companies, right? The sweatshops, for instance, which was a big deal, and other, other, other issues. Uh, then the social side became important, and then we started looking at projects related to traceability, visibility, where things are coming from, which we just detected how complex a supply chain was. And uh, this actually, by the way, tracked down to many of the emerging economies in which we've done a lot of research, right? Some of those are not really related to sustainability, but they are actually giving a lot of the components or raw materials for, for any organization in the world. And then now what I, what I saw is that I remember probably seven years ago, uh, it started at least uh, to the best of my knowledge, maybe a little bit earlier, companies are starting really very, being very ambitious with their, with their carbon reduction goals. They said, now we have the climate pledge. We have like, I don't remember, 13. I should know this one, but all the United Nations uh, sustainability goals. And we are going to just have indicators for all of them. And let's just go for it. And uh, it reminds me a lot now talking about the packaging. Uh, we actually did a project with that uh, recently with Dell. A couple of students work on this on this project, uh, retention and scan. And what I remember of the project is that uh, they moved, like they were trying to use more recycled material for packaging. So if we use more recycled material, they were having actually a clear goal for recycled material. And then what happened is that um, by changing the composition of the materials, by using more recycled material, they actually change also the dimensions and weight of the package, which in turn also affected the whole logistics operations. So they were actually increasing carbon emissions while at the same time you know, reducing packaging. So we realized that there is a connectivity between also the sustainability goals. And, and now what I see happening is that they try to find more systemic uh, approaches to really solve all the problems. There is more intentions to understand, like we already did what was very clear to, redu to reduce or achieve our goals. What's next? How do we build a roadmap that is gonna get us there? And also understanding the financials. The financials should be always there. There's always a business case, as, as you say. So we need to look at this every time that we come up with, uh, with any idea, at least in the research side as well. Excellent, thank you. And, and I think you all know, I see questions coming in. So if you have questions to the panel, please submit those and we'll get to those towards the end of, of the questions that I asked this group. Uh, let me be a little bit of a jerk and self-promoting at the same time for a second. So one of the things that we also do at CTL is our annual state of supply chain sustainability report. We've put the QR code up in case you want to read more about that. And that's something that we've done with Rachel now for a few years. I bring that question up next because we ask what pressures firms to engage in supply chain sustainability. Fastest growing topic is investors. 
But the second, and that didn't come up in this, um, so you're welcome to comment on that, but the one I really wanna get to the brass tacks of is, no one said the government's making me do this. But I feel like at least in some of our work, some of the compulsion to act comes from regulation. So I wonder if each of you could speak to regulation that you think is most impactful as far as your companies and your clients' companies engaging in supply chain sustainability, and maybe even more importantly for the topic of this audience, what's coming down the pike that people need to be aware of as far as sustainability regulation? Whoever's most excited can go first. I love regulation. That is, <laughs> I knew it, I knew I it. I am really excited. There's always one. <laughs> I'll start with that. Thank I, you, you, know, you I, We, in our prep call, we're kind of talking, I think all three of us have very different ways that we're looking at this. So the, the one that comes up the most for C.H. Robinson and for, for our clients that we're working with is anything related to carbon reporting. And so I touched on a number of these, but whether that comes out of the EU um, and CSRD, the Corporate Sustainab Sustainability Reporting Directive, uh, whether that is what may likely be coming from the SEC soon or what's coming out of California and likely some states shortly after that. All of those are, uh, are requirements for companies to be reporting on their scope three emissions. So they are upstream and your downstream carbon emissions. Um, so I, that, that's huge. And I think you know, it kind of starts, it's easy to say, oh, that's happening in Europe. That's kind of the first ones you usually hear about. We don't really operate in Europe. We don't have to worry about it. Okay. Then you move to the US and all of a sudden the SEC is on this and so you go, okay, well, we're not publicly traded so I'm not quite as worried about it. Uh, well, guess what, California, it doesn't matter if you're public or private, as long as you are operating in California and you're over a billion in revenue annually, you're also gonna be falling under that. So there's, there's gonna be levers that are being pushed and even if that isn't your company, as a, as, someone who, as a company that is likely working with other companies that fall within this, you're gonna have a knock on your door soon um, and the question is going to be, what are my emissions when I work with you in whatever the way that is within my supply chain? And how can you prove to me that that data is something that I can then submit formally to our government and, and feel that it is kind of auditable? Because not only are there more regulations coming down the pike, but also kind of that whole concept of greenwashing and, and the amount of uh, scrutiny that's being put on this data and any kind of sustainability claims is, is skyrocketing as well. Um, so the carbon emissions is big ones. Others, uh, you know, kind of related to that are things coming around California with the clean uh, fleet and clean, clean trucks. And so that's going to be forcing more zero emissions vehicles. Uh, that's another whole conversation we can talk about later. Um, but yeah, anything really carbon related, there's a lot coming and it's going to be touching scope three. Thank you. Jason and Shannon come from different worlds. But I imagine there's some regulation in your minds too. We're seeing a lot in uh, EU deforestation regulation, so the EUDR. Um, uh, it impacts a lot of different, like, really base commodities, uh, you know, beef and leather uh, coming out of Brazil, uh, soy. If you, if you turn a grocery store upside down, about 60% of what hits the ceiling is probably going to be related in some capacity to the soy supply chain. Uh, it's in a lot of the feeds, it's in a number of different elements, and so, um, you know, uh, needing to be able to trace some of these materials now all the way back to their you know, in the case of, of cattle to their birth farms, in the case of soy, you know, back to the farms where they're harvested, and be able to demonstrate where brands are not contributing to deforestation. Um, another one that's an interesting one that's not specifically related to sustain sustainability is uh, FISMA 204, so the Food Safety Modernization Act, Rule 204. Um, I, I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but it's around high-risk food categories, needing to ultimately have, uh, you know, a similar lens of traceability going back to the farm or boat. And uh, what we're seeing is a lot of brands are using that, even though it's specifically related to food safety, a lot of brands are using that as a, a, a means to gather more sustainability data through their supply chain. Because it already has to happen, you know, there's different actors now collecting data, they're connecting it to their traceability lock code, and now they can use that as a means to get more ESG data about their, their sourcing, so. Um, well, so if I start with the packaging front, um, there are some really interesting things happening uh, in the regulatory space. Um, the two big ones are extended producer responsibility and the UN uh, plastic treaty that is mm -hmm. being negotiated right now. So extended producer responsibility, I, I, I assume most of people in this room know about that, but it's basically, um, it's gaining huge uh, traction at national levels and at state levels in the US. Um, uh, and 
it, what it basically does is requires that people pay or, or the companies pay for the type of packaging they're putting in the ecosystem with the idea that that money then goes to recovering that, that packaging back. Um, it's specifically focused on plastic, uh, usually. Um, and of course, the devil is in the details of the design, as it is with every regulatory um, approach. Uh, you know, some countries are doing this better than others. It was born in Germany and Europe. Um, and some countries are creating situations where there's a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, perverse incentives that are created around this, and it's not clear where the money goes. In other places, it's pretty clear where the money goes, but it's not being used very strategically in the system. Um, and some places, it's working quite well. Um, so that's the extended producer responsibility. Uh, the UN Plastics Treaty that is being negotiated uh, even this year and is supposed to be finalized by the next year um, is a... Um, uh, is still a little bit unclear exactly what it will have in it. Uh, it may have some banning of certain materials or certain uses of materials. There's some conversation around uh, certain toxic chemicals that may or may not be allowed in certain plastics. Um, the hope is that there is some guidance, especially to um, countries that don't have good waste management systems on how and what they should be doing with their waste, especially that waste containing plastic. There's a lot of informal burning still out in the world, even in Michigan, where I'm from. <laughs> My neighbors often will burn their waste um, on the side of the road uh, in the rural areas. Um, uh, so uh, we're still waiting to see what that will hold. Um, but it is a very exciting uh, treaty that um, is being informed by similar climate change treaties um, and hopefully will avoid some of the same mistakes that previous treaties have, have had. Um, and then the other piece in the waste space is, uh, there is there isn't regulation around this, but there's a growing understanding of the implications of methane emissions, which come from organic waste going mm. into landfills. So even in the United States, where most or many landfills have methane capture that's then put back into power generation, or at least flared into carbon dioxide, um, the, uh, it's still the third highest uh, producer of methane in the United States, so you can imagine in other countries that don't have those types of technologies, it's often even higher. Mm -hmm. um, and methane is a greenhouse gas that is shorter lived in the environment, but 80 times more uh, potent than, um, than CO2. Uh, and so as we realize that we are not coming anywhere close to our emissions reductions that we need to accomplish, um, there is this increased focus on keeping methane out of the environment because of its higher potency um, to gain us a little bit of time up front. Um, and I would not be surprised if we saw some regulation around that coming. Excellent. And, and as I, I hear you talking about it, I hear, well, one of the things that struck me right away is um, we hear about regulations coming out of the European Union, the United Nations, and, and Rachel brought up California. It reminded me, one of my favorite authors on the topic, Daniel Jurgen, once wrote, um, the California Air Resources Board has always punched above its weight. And, and I think we still see that being true, that there's a, perhaps an inordinate amount of power coming out of certain parts of the world. And, and we see that in um, our survey work, too. And I, and I want to pitch this to Josue. So when we looked at you know, where pressure comes from, a lot of it we see from regulators. And we look at where that turns into net zero goals. We see it heavily in the United States and Europe, but not as much in Latin America. And I know you do lots of work with both your research labs in Latin America. Could you comment on, is regulatory pressure part of the sustainability movement in, the, in Mexico and in Latin America, or is the drive coming from somewhere else, do you think? <laughs> I, I, um, I will say that there is no drive on sustainability, I will say, right? Like in general, of course, uh, uh, many countries in Latin America, including in Mexico, I'm, I'm Mexican in case you were wondering, um, Actually, they are part of the Paris Accord. They actually are having some sort of uh, programs also inspired by many of the things that are happening in Smartway, EPA. So these, these things happen, right? So we, we know it's there. Uh, but even when you consider the, uh, the program that also, for instance, Mexico is part of the cap and trade systems, uh, you know, you see the prices of the carbon, which is also another topic, is, is extremely low, let's say, compared to what you see in European uh, nations. Uh, I believe the, the drive uh, comes because of uh, multinational companies. So when you look at the context of uh, Latin America, I actually like uh, a study that was published a few years ago, but it's actually from McKinsey Global Institute that says, the, I believe it's something like the, a tale of two Latin Americas or a tale of two Mexicos, but they show the comparison between the, the, the largest companies in the world versus the rest. 
right? And you see the largest, like if I'm talking about uh, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Danone, uh, Unilever, PNG, like whoever you mention, those companies are reporting higher growth in Latin America than in any other developed country. And you say, how is that possible? Oh, so why the region is not growing there? And then you see, well, because the vast majority are in fact uh, micro firms, right? And 99% are less than 10 employees. Uh, they disappear at rates that you wouldn't imagine. And their challenge to survive is so large that the uh, social environmental sustainability is not really part of their, their, their vision, right? They are just trying to make a living for the next day, which I believe is, is a little bit, uh, unfair to pot potentially ask them to really do beyond beyond that at this point. But of course, when they are suppliers uh, or, or customers of these big companies, this is when it makes a difference. Because if, if you not remember the, 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 the saying that I was mentioning with L'Oreal, I took part of this um, uh, session with L'Oreal uh, a few years ago in New York. They invited me to give a presentation on transportation CO2 emissions, and they were actually having 70 logistics providers. So all of you were there. <laughs> if I recall. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember that during the presentation, they made a big announcement of, they, they call it, if I recall, sharing the beauty, which means sharing the responsibility of you guys measuring the mission so that you become more suppliers, in a nutshell. I'm paraphrasing. And, uh, and it was very interesting for me to see how if this big monster will say, well, you know, we are having these expansion programs. Uh, if you want to be part of it, then you need to do something for the environment. So a company that a uh, few weeks before that event was saying, what you are doing is ridiculous, nobody cares, immediately is like, oh, we love sustainability, we are gonna go with everything. Right? And, and this happens also in other countries. You will see these reactions because everybody wants to be part of the global supply chains. They want to be part of that, that creates a lot of value. If you want to be part of the game, and those are actually having that pressure, whether you believe or not, you need to be part of the game. And this is more what I see the driver in, in these emerging economies. Excellent, thank you. Some questions are coming in. Please continue to send them in or to upvote questions that you see on Slido if you really want something asked that is also an appropriate question, which all of these are. Uh, <laughs> the third one, and kind of building on that, thinking about the global supply chain. So the, our unit of analysis is supply chain. Our unit of analysis isn't so much within the four walls of the firm, but the connection between multiple firms. And I wonder if, if any of you could comment on is achieving supply chain sustainability, like the practical nuts and bolts of doing it, necessarily supplier development? Is that how we get it done? We work with suppliers who are in different places in their journey. Does anyone have any examples or stories about using collaboration as the way that we achieve our supply chain sustainability goals? I mean, we frequently work with uh, circumstances where you have a large buyer, whether it be a brand or a retailer or other, and they're really trying to kind of push upstream to get that data all the way you know, back to the source about their, their supply chains. And for us, um, and this is just kind of a shout out to, to GS1, that really begins with a shared language. Uh, without that, um, you have a big problem. In fact, it's kind of odd to me that the um, supply chain data evolved the way it did. I think if you play the tape back 100 times, you'd already have more shared language between systems. Um, but for some reason, uh, there's not as much, but it's really taking hold now. We use the EPSIS standard, or the EPCIS, which is a GS1 standard, but there's other standards where you can have information exchange between systems, and that's really what you're gonna have to have to get you know, really upstream data, and in some cases, across different industries. You know, you've got now retail buyers that are asking questions of carbon footprint, but they're also asking questions like, what goes into my feed? So you've got soy that goes into feed, that goes into fish, you know, that, that might have ended up in the salmon that we ate earlier, you know, outside, you know, farmed Atlantic salmon, where, where suddenly that's, that's an issue. And, and again, all that starts with a shared language that the different stakeholders are using. And I, I mentioned, uh, you know, seafood. I'm on the board of something called the Global Dialogue on Seafood Traceability. And it's, it's all about using a GS1 standard, the EPSA standard for, uh, but specific to the seafood context and creating those collaborations for brands, for retailers, but with those upstream suppliers that really, quite frankly, right now, maybe aren't as familiar with these standards, but they need to be, so. Thank you. Rachel and Shannon, can you do supply chain sustainability on your own? Is it a collaborative process? Yeah, I, we've figured it out at Robinson. We just aren't sharing it with anyone because <laughs> it's not <laughs> How's your moment? Um, yeah, I mean, it, the collaboration is critical. I know that seems so cliche, but it, it truly is. And I can list off a lot of ways that I'm seeing that play out in the transportation space. 
Um, I think one, you know, you spoke to this a bit about the, the language. I think reporting is another really important one. Um, groups like the Smart Freight Center in Amsterdam creating models for how we're actually reporting on transportation. They work with you all and, and Smartway and all of those that we're, we're speaking not only a collective language, but we're all using similar kind of apples to apples comparison around reporting is huge. Um, another place that I see that's going to continue to be critical is especially within transportation. You know, we keep talking about there's a term called the, you know, the messy middle that we're in right now um, around EVs, around the use of alternative fuels. Uh, you have OEMs, you have carriers, you have 3PLs, you have shippers, you have government agencies, you have chargers, like car charging infrastructures. There's all these groups that sometimes kind of stand around and do a little bit of the Spider Man meme. And the only way that like any of that's going to happen is if everyone's at the table and having conversations around kind of what are the benefits for each of these groups, where are they willing to give, like it, it just will never happen and on its own. So that's another place that I, I think that's incredibly critical. You see that through groups like you know Sustainable Fuel Buyers Alliance and some of those that are coming together where it's you know we're we're large shippers. We know this is important. We need to find a way to collectively move this, and we can't do it on our own. So I, I'm starting to see some of that. I think it will continue to have to happen. It'll be forced through, you know, regulations. It'll as as you need to be getting more data from your suppliers. It'll be forced through kind of as companies are getting closer to their 2030, 2040, 2050 goals that they're going to be more and more willing to come to the table. Um, the one thing that I will call out that you uh, mentioned, Josue, is is also kind of how. Shippers, especially large shippers is where I see it mostly, can do that in a really good way where it's kind of more about capacity building than forcing the hand. Mm -hmm. um, because there are so many companies out there that are small and are not either collecting the data they need or they haven't started talking about sustainability. Those suppliers, that can be a really big burden. And I watch some groups like L'Oreal's a great example or Walmart or others that are out there that don't just come down and say, all right, here are all the things you better do and you better do it by you know X, Y, Z date. They say, hey, let us help you. Like we will. They put. They invest a lot in education, in you know, helping people kind of move along in that journey. Because not only is that helpful to them as a company, but it's that's going to move the entire industry. So I think that capacity building, not just kind of the everyone that can and is there and is at the same place coming to the table to collaborate, but helping move everyone along, um, is the only way that we're going to see kind of any kind of movement in the transportation space. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm sitting here trying to think. There are two ways that I could think about answering this question. One of them is really interesting to me because uh, in our supply chain, um, a big chunk of it is the informal sector. Um, and we work with some of the poorest, most disenfranchised people in the world who are the waste pickers, who are often picking up uh, you know, plastic bottles out off of waste dumps around the world. Um, and uh, a part of your question was about both collaboration but also capability building. And so bringing uh, that sector into the supply chain in such a way that you can ensure that you do not have human rights abuses, mm -hmm. children, uh, child labor, um, and you have health, health and sanitation for people um, that are working in that space uh, is a really big part of that. And it starts by educating uh, those workers around what their rights are and then also that there is a better way to do this uh, and, and, and also educating them even how to have a formal job sometimes. Um, because you know what it means, why it is important to show up on time and to be part of your shift and those sorts of things. So um, I do think there's a, a there's a huge amount of collaboration that can happen um, in in that first, in, at least for us, in that first part of the supply chain. Um, that is really important about that sort of dialogue between producers, to, uh, the, the producers who take a bottle and turn it back into a recycled pellet, uh, for example, talking with the waste pickers about what is the level of contamination that's okay, um, uh, what do our corporate off-takers care about in terms of human rights abuses and ethic, ethical supply chains and transparency, um, and how can we help you to develop that supply chain into something more formal um, that also uh, it, it avoids those sorts of abuses. Um, and uh, the other one is actually an example I just heard recently. It's not ours, and I'm sort of jealous because I really love it. Um, there's an organization called RAP in the UK that was developed to um, actually get recycling running about 20 years ago in, uh, across the UK market. And they, have, they take the same approach we do, which is a sort of system level approach. And one of their examples of things that they did was they discovered that glass in the UK was not getting recycled effectively because most of the glass 
uh, being being generated was coming from wine bottles, which were in which were green, and most of the glass being used in the UK is brown because most of the UK or or clear because most of the the spirits and other products in the UK are beer and whiskey and stuff, and they don't go into green bottles. So um, they they got together with a bunch of the wine producers around the world, even you know from Africa, from South Africa and all over Europe, and convinced them to bottle their wine on shore in the UK. Um, and instead of shipping it in the bottles from the countries that they were coming from, they would ship them in huge bladders that were the size of their shipping containers. And not only did this mean that they could reuse bottles more effectively in the UK, and they had plenty of green bottles you know, still coming into the country to be able to use their bottles properly, but it also meant that the quality of the wine was better because they were shipping um, in, in these big uh, volumes that meant that they didn't go through the same heating and cooling, which often damages the wine in the shipping process. Plus, of course, there was a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions because you're not shipping glass everywhere. Um, so it was like this huge win-win thing, of, but it, it only came together because they were able to bring all of these different suppliers together um, to make this work. Thank you for that, and I was just thinking, that's the second time today wine has been the example. I think previously it was for So I don't know what that says about that I noticed it or that our audience brought it up. I'll leave that open interpretation. I, I want to go to, to the next one and then and I'll, I'll pitch to Josue on this. But So I asked you all, does your firm have a net zero timeline goal? And 42% said no. We then asked about um, when, you, if you have a goal, when is it? Yes, by 2050, 29%. By 2030, 17%. This may be surprising, but I would say this tracks with the worldwide estimates that we get in our global survey, particularly for a North American audience. Let me jump right into why I think there might be a lot of no's, but feel free to push back on me. And I'll start with Josue and then maybe go down the group. I think there's a lot of no's because scope three is really hard. <laughs> so Josue, could you start by sort of to the uninitiated, what is scope three, why is it hard? And then I invite any of the panelists who, who have some comment on the challenge of scope three to bring those two. Thanks. Sure, that's the easy question. Thank you so much. <laughs> Finally afraid, an easy one. I was afraid you were gonna ask me something about the wine or something. <laughs> so, uh, so we have the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, the greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas protocol defines uh, three different scopes when we are do, doing the greenhouse gas inventory. So you want to account for all the different greenhouse gases. So usually when we do it, there are different ways. I will not simply oversimplify it, but of course it matters what is the type of gas that you're doing. Like you were, for instance, explaining about the methane and the, the amount of times it's more damaging than actually just carbon dioxide. But we, we tend to just use CO2 because we convert all the different gases into CO2 equivalent. So that's the amount of heat that a CO2 molecule can trap in the atmosphere. Just consider this as a global warming potential. Now you understand why we are always using trees instead of this, right? Now, the other, the other is when you are doing this, you have three scopes. Scope one, as a company, when you do the calculation of the assets you own. So whatever are your assets, this is a simplification, they call it the direct emissions. This is emissions that you own in scope one. When you consider the production of electricity or energy, right? like for instance, if we switch on or off, you know, it's like we are, we in fact are not producing the emissions, right? That somebody else produce the energy, but we are responsible because we are the ones who are switching on and off. Right? So that's, when you count that as part of your responsibility, then you consider this, this as a scope two. And now scope three is everything else that you have influence on, but you do not own any assets. For instance, for Rachel's business, everything is a scope three emission. I mean, scope one is probably admin work, I guess, and some, some offices, uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, it, what you do here is that when you account for all the emissions that are related to scope three, for instance, when I place an order, I'm actually causing transportation activities, I'm causing some warehousing, some inventory management, everything that is triggered because certain decisions I'm making, this is a scope three. If I consider how my product, the product is used by the consumer, that is also part of a scope three emissions. So uh, that part usually, to your question, Dave, it's at least 80% of all the emissions related to your supply chain. I'm, I'm actually being very careful. It could be 90% or even higher. So that's why it's a big deal. Now, when companies make this claim, you say, well, why, why is it hard? Well, you already know. Like for me, the question about the collaboration, I'm probably answering that as well, it has to do a lot also how, how accurate are you with your own data that you have in-house. Like for instance, that project that I mentioned, the green button, where we communicated to the consumers the amount of emissions uh, and trees, 
it was just an exercise to connect logistics with commercial, which, had, as you know, they hate each other. So just to say, oh, I'm going to commend this to the consumer, they say, oh, you don't touch my consumers, you know, because you're going to screw up everything. <laughs> and, and all of these things were happening, right? So those collaborations, even internally, do not exist. It's, it, I cannot even imagine how those things will happen if we are trying to involve even more entities, which I believe, to your point, I love it how you say it. We share and collaborate because we share the pain, right? In a way, it's like we all struggle with the same. But anyway, it's always very challenging, scope three emissions, because are the, are the hardest, are the ones that you do not own in your assets, therefore you need to use a lot of activity-based methods. What was the activity, how much it was transported, let me use some standard emission factors, carbon intensity factors, let me just get a number. And when you use those aggregate methods, what can actually translate into is making decisions that potentially are not gonna really help you reduce your emissions. And I was just giving the example of transportation. You remember the distance. Everybody uses distance, cargo, and emission factor to estimate emissions. So if you use that formula, that means when you are empty, empty, empty loaded, you actually are having zero emissions. Problem solved, right? <laughs> So the, the model does not capture what is actually happening. And, if, and that's why, because of that formula, you always say, well, let's reduce the distance. Right. Well, because the other formula says that. So the, the more you aggregate and, 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 and use that for making decisions, the more you're gonna get wrong, wrong strategies, I will say. So the better you use the data available, the, high, the higher the level of detail in your estimations, then the, the, the easier it's gonna be for you as an organization to define strategies that are gonna be better. But this is the challenge. Scope three emissions is the topic of today. So back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else on scope three from where you sit? Is it as hard as Hostway said? No. I mean, yeah, <laughs> everything you just said is exactly <laughs> right. Think about the number of suppliers every company is working with. If you are trying to knock on the door of every single one of those suppliers to hope that they have already tracked the data and hope that they're able to get it to you in a timely manner in a way that you are then able to take that and report it out in a way that's needed. Like, this is a really manual process. There's a lot of questions around the data. I think, you know, all of those things are, are really clear. Um, but to your point about kind of the pain and, and the, the, like, how you then can work together on that, I think the other piece of that is, I'll get questions, Steve Rates, who is incredible and is here right now and is very good when I was getting uh, started on a lot of this, that he was asking just really good questions as Robinson was starting to, to go down this road of reporting scope three, et cetera, et cetera. Like, well, aren't we double counting when it comes to scope three? And I was like, yeah, and, you know, I mean, there's like, there's things and, like there's a lot of complexity to it. And also that means that that's why everyone needs to be in the room because we are all going to be then looking for similar solutions, right? So Robinson's in the process right now of looking at setting our own scope three goal. Um, we will rely very closely on those same shippers who are looking to us to help them with their goals for, uh, you know, to be able to, to decrease our own scope three because to your point, that's 99 point whatever percent of our total, our total emissions. So it just, it is very difficult on the data side. It is very complex and also hopefully what that'll do and in some days, you know, continue to drive those those uh, collaborations. Thank you. And, and the questions are coming in. I think more people want to talk to you all than we will have time for. So apologies in advance to those we don't get to. Let me ask one more, and then we'll go to some of the most upvoted questions. And, and I want to start with Shannon and Jason. So, like, we spent most of this time talking about the challenges, like how hard it is, all the things you have to do to improve sustainability in the supply chain. But like you do it, you lead big teams, you've founded companies dedicated to doing it. Could you comment on you know, why it's worth doing? And I, I guess I mean more specifically, sometimes people have questions about justifying the cost and the effort that goes into adding sustainability to a corporate portfolio. So Jason and Shannon, can you talk about why it's worth doing and, and how do you help people understand justification, if you will, of the cost of adding sustainability to their decision making? Go ahead. You too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, it's interesting because, um, I mean, on a personal level, it's worth it because I tell people all the time, if I didn't get paid to do what I do, I would pay to do what I do. <laughs> Love it. It's a, it's a puzzle. It's a challenging puzzle of trying to figure out not only how to, uh, how to be a part of th these solutions, but also to connect the data of these solutions that are happening. And so, uh, you know, on a personal level, I guess that's the answer. On, you know, from a from an organizational level, um, you know, I think earlier uh, uh, Joe on the previous panel had said, you know, we're, we're not selling clicks; uh, brands are selling trust. And I think I think that's a big component there. Of uh, you know, brands right now, we're in the midst in my 
view and, and what we see, particularly in the food system, of a real transformation. And uh, you know, FISMA 204 is a big part of that, but there are other things happening as well where we're gonna have significantly more data in these supply chains and the ability to affect things like Best Buy dates, which are causing a lot of that post-consumer waste, which is leading to uh, larger emissions, but also just food waste, which is just sometimes, you know, half of what we take out of the ocean, we throw away, which is, you know, obscene when you think about it. And, uh, you know, this is a real opportunity for brands who are going to be doing these things, but to do them now and fast and develop that trust with their, with their customer and, and with the overall market. And so, you know, we see those who are taking that opportunity and they're getting the, the dividend now. They're gonna do it, but you know, why not now? So yeah, that's. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, um, on a personal level to start there as well, uh, I have, um, I'm a very much a mission driven person and the environment has always been my mission. So I started out as a conservation biologist um, and went into management consulting, learned in my first year of management consulting that if I wasn't focused on something environmental, I was not happy. <laughs> um, and found a way to do that within the management consulting wor world and then brought it around to the nonprofit space, which I kind of feel like it was always where I was intended to go. Um, one of the things that I learned during the years that I was at McKinsey and I, uh, was a, a lot of the research I worked on energy efficiency in buildings, regulatory strategy around uh, greenhouse gas emissions and power production, uh, sustainable transportation, like all sorts of different stuff. Um, we wrote a lot of really cool reports, but I began to be frustrated by writing reports and then not having the opportunity to enact them in, in the real world. So. The reason that uh, I, I started Delterra and with the, with the mission that it has is that there is a huge gap in capability between what we say should be happening out there and what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. And nobody is spending, or not many people are spending enough time on trying to actually shift those human systems so that we can actually, um, so that we know, right, once every, like, for example, once the UN plastic pack be becomes aligned, um, you know, they're going to come out with a set of guidelines on, you know, we've got to put proper waste management out into these countries. And at the moment, no one really knows how to get that to happen. Uh, it's, not a, as, it's not as easy as just throwing a bunch of money at it, because what's really missing when we do that is all of the capabilities of how to run that infrastructure, how to do the collection, how to change behaviors, and then also all of the OPEX investment, right? And making sure that we figure out where is the money gonna come from to continue running that right. infrastructure at the end of the day. So that's what we focus on because it's, it's a huge gap in our understanding um, of, uh, of how to sort of implement the vision um, of what we do. And you know, from an ethical perspective, uh, you know, I mean, there, it, it, it's sort of died down in recent years, but, um, you know, a couple of years ago, you couldn't open a newspaper without seeing a whale washed up on a beach with a belly full of plastic or, mm. um, you know, uh, people dying because of uh, um, different materials being burned along waysides and that creating toxic uh, plumes, you know, in the air that was ca causing contamination and poisoning people. Um, so, you know, really honestly, uh, you know, climate change is the existential threat of our, of our time, yeah. um, but there are lots of others, as you threw up there, right, biodiversity loss and pollution, and, um, and, and I think um, all of these are important and we need to keep them all in mind as we try and fix these systems at a systemic level. Um, otherwise, you know, it's very personal, but what are we leaving our children? Thank you, Rachel, for you. Maybe also, you know, starting with the personal mission, but I wonder if you could also comment on, you and I both work in trucking, and, and I think sometimes trucking is not seen as a bespoke service. Uh, is it, Personally, what makes it worth it to you to do, but also, how do you make that pitch to shippers that might just be looking for the lowest cost option? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I started a nonprofit and then went corporate, so I sold my soul. I'll go the opposite direction oh, no. and talk about the business <laughs> side of it. I certainly, I really have always been mission driven, so on the personal level, it's very important. I like spending time outside, all of those things. I think as a company, when we look at it, you know, there's a, a number of things I would speak to. One, you spoke to, to a bit, that 
a lot of these things are going to happen anyway. And so we have the option of either kind of being leaders or fast followers and having this be a competitive advantage because a lot of our customers are asking for it. Yeah. Or we can wait until it's table stakes and then, then it's table stakes. And that's still an important thing that companies are doing. But from a business perspective, where do you want to sit with that? Um, and so that, that's a really important piece for us to be thinking about. Our customers want this. How do we handle that? Our investors do. Our people do. How do we you know, continue to, to um, attract good talent? So it still is a competitive advantage there. Um, I think the other piece is car transportation is a notoriously uh, hard to decarbonize sector. And, and that is very, you know, you see that when you look at kind of where, pe where companies tend to start when they look at their supply chain emissions or when they look at addressing supply chain. There's a lot of, I don't want to say low hanging fruit, it's hard work, but there are a lot of things you can do before you get to transportation because there's not a super easy button when it comes to that. On the flip side of that, there's a ton of really cool innovation happening. There is a really a lot of cool stuff that's happening on the tech side, and that's going to continue to happen in the transportation sector. So Robinson getting to be a part of those conversations about how do we make more efficient supply chains, which we've been doing forever. How do we tie that back to su sustainability and kind of c find those people that are willing to come to the table and do really cool stuff like companies that are using sail sailing across the ocean now. And maybe that won't be scalable. But we're trying things and carbon capture. There's just a lot happening out there. So I think that it's um, driving innovation. It's something that our stakeholders care about. And then the last thing that you talked about is we're a company that's been around for 120 years. We want to be a company that's around for another 120 years. And if we're going to do that, we need our investors to believe that we're going to be around. Our customers need to see us as, as that. And we need to be thinking about the earth in that way um, because it, it just is the reality of what carbon looks at. So those are our, ours. Thank you. So, so I want to make sure I get to some of the most popular audience questions. And Josue, since you put numbers on a slide, people want to pitch numbers back to you. So um, I will preface for my friend that he doesn't have to have the exact answer. <laughs> the exact question is, does investing in EVs at 2x cost make sense? No. no. No, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. So you know, clearly there's a lot of context to answering that yes or no. But Josue, you've done a lot of sustainable logistics research. What, what would you share with, or what insights would you share to the person asking that question? I was actually having a, a, a slide that would show, you know, like the the present moment, you know, with the carbon target, and then showing the carbon emissions, and then everybody keeping their emissions stable until finally the technology becomes affordable, <laughs> right? So everybody's waiting for that, and that's the elephant in the room. So shippers are asking uh, logistics providers put some EVs there so that I can have green deliveries. And then, the, and then the, the logistics providers come and say, okay, so are you willing to pay the premium fee? Oh, no, 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 I'm not gonna pay for anything. And this is usually always the issue. Nobody wants to put like the hard hand on this because at the end they are partners, but the, the issue is, is becoming very relevant. I actually have an example. I will not mention the company, but it's also one of the largest uh, logistics providers that they, they actually acquire uh, hundreds of EVs thinking that uh, the customers were going to be willing to pay for the premium fee. And uh, it's very funny because all, all the customers are actually making these climate pledges and also putting the accounting of scope three emissions. And then it says, well, are you willing to pay the premium fee? They already made a deal with the OEMs. They actually were willing to go with the financial. Uh, how many of those uh, customers or, or, uh, decided actually to go for the, for the premium? And I was guessing, I don't know, 10%, there's zero. So no one actually said which always, he gives me a hard time because it's like, uh, I always say, let's go for the environment, consumers care, and he says, well, this is what they say, but at the time of paying, yeah. nobody's paying. So now the issue is, what are we gonna do with this? And actually, we've been working with this financial, it's like, okay, so now I have hundreds, which by the way, I made a deal with the OEM, so there are 100 more coming in, and where we are gonna put them, right? So the issues that we are now dealing is, actually, I believe, quite relevant. From once, uh, whether this is gonna be only an issue of last mile, because we know in last mile, this is already solved in a way, right? We know that technology exists and you know, it's gonna happen sooner or later. Uh, I believe it's gonna become more affordable and discussions on that development of, uh, of research technology behind it is gonna solve the issue, I believe. But the question is whether we can use this in the middle mile or the first mile or the drayage operation. And I believe this is, again, it's gonna happen. I believe this is what I meant when I said investment in the next five, 10 years is gonna really drive us there. And to your point, Rachel, I believe it's better to be a leader than to actually try to catch up. Uh, yet, uh, the financials are not there yet, and there is gonna be a bigger question to answer. Everybody's now discussing about how the network is gonna look like. Where do I put my charging stations? Right? Do I piggyback with the, with the hubs in the warehouse of the future? How we can actually build a network? So imagine that you envision how your network is gonna look like. 
Now you have, I don't know, thousands of, uh, of vehicles in the operations. How are you gonna do that transition? Which are gonna be the first batch of fleet that you're gonna take off and which ones are gonna put in without damaging your business and your on-time deliveries? And then once you start envisioning that transition, that's actually gonna, in my view, make a difference who's gonna get a competitive advantage or not uh, in, the, in the coming years. So I didn't answer the question of the financial, <laughs> but I can tell you so far, you are lucky if, if this works, either you have a government that gives you a subsidy or somebody's actually willing to pay a little bit more. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't think particularly for the, for the middle, even if you're in Europe and the mileage actually gives you the, the outreach to do it, it's gonna, it's gonna work with the, with the, fi with the finances. I, I think it's not gonna be the case, at least in, in, I believe in the short term. In the following years, we may see completely different, different numbers. Thank you for that. We're coming close to time. Let me make a cheeky answer to the great question Anonymous asks. <laughs> How can companies better educate their associates on sustainability efforts? Plus, way I think a class just launched. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I wasn't prepared, but. <laughs> <laughs> so we've launched a uh, online supply chain management sustainability class that Josue leads. That might be one way to do it. We'd talk about it more, but we are almost out of time. Please join me in thanking our panelists for their insights this afternoon. Thank you all.